and Piaget, as Karis mentioned, emphasis on cooperation. Uh, looking across the very different domains, I would make uh, one or two observations. First, um, that apart from the work being done by Anna Lee and Karis on sociocognitive conflict, these are all very positive. Just in a loose sense, these are positive things. You know, it's all about common and shared and um, uh, inclusiveness and so on. But in terms of transformative social interaction, we shouldn't expect that it's always the nice things which lead to development or transformation. Sometimes it can be traumatic and difficult and tension building. For me, that's what some of the work on sociocognitive conflict shows. The tension is sometimes needed to bring people to a new level of understanding. So um, that's all one point. The second thing is that um, everyone's talking about what we might call the things which should be present for transformative social interaction. And what I'm going to talk about is the things which should be absent. <laughs> uh, because we, we, we need some conditions for and also some things that should be avoided. And the semantic barriers idea, which is the way of thinking, the way in which you approach the other person, is, is some way which we should avoid. So how did I get to looking at this issue from, from the other side? Um, we were doing some experiments on perspective taking. Um, uh, and basically it was testing an idea that if you do a joint task, um, and in this case it's a map task. So you see here you have this kind of map, and you have a director and follower. You give the director a map with a route on, and you give the follower a map without a route on, and the director has to verbally direct the follower through the map. And people have, uh, they can solve it very easily. And then in the last trial, we give them a, a map which is slightly different, but they don't know the maps are different. So it is insolvable, and it ends in a huge argument. And, and you just keep telling them that they haven't solved it, and, and discussions go on for half an hour with people getting very aggravated. The, the task was developed by Blackguard in the 1970s to create conflict, and I, I was really shocked by how much conflict it created. We, we did it with some married couples, and they, they didn't talk to each other for hours. It was a very powerful creation of conflict. But to solve it, and to solve the task, to realize that the maps are different, you have to listen to the follower. The follower says, it's not working. And you have to go, OK, tell me why it's not working. You have to take their perspective. Yeah? So and, and then the manipulation we did was one what we call sort of fixed position, where the, the people were just locked in their positions. Another one where after each trial, they were encouraged to cognitively take the perspective of the other, think what the other person might be feeling at this moment in time. And the third one we were interested in called position exchange, where they would alternate positions. So the director would be the follower in the next trial. And then, um, this is an example, the two maps, director, follower, the director gets a route, it, it goes fine. And then here we have the conflict trial, where you see this, this uh, part isn't on that map, they get confused and lost. But what we found is that in the fixed position, one out of 20 dyads solved it. In the cognitive perspective taking, five out of 20 dyads solved it. And when you did position exchange, where they alternated director follower, you got 17 out of 20 dyads solving it. So of course, very significant. I don't want to talk about that perspective taking, sort of what that means for that. I want to talk about what happened when we looked at the discussions. So we start to focus on who was able to solve it and who wasn't. Um, so in the fixed position, you know this classic, a married couple, the guy is the director, and it was always worse when the man was the director. <laughs> and um, you'd say, you know, quite simply, you know, I think this was Nora or somebody, you know, Nora, just shut up and listen. You know, you've always been terrible at man reading. Now, because he thinks she's always terrible at map reading, he can't listen to her when she says, but there's no road on my map. And then he just, and then we got a lot of this, no, 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 just shut up. Yeah. Um, in contrast, when we did the position exchange, we actually got a lot of questions. The, the directors would ask a lot more questions. And so something would go wrong, and the director would say something like, okay, that, that, that's weird. What else do you see there? Or tell me. Uh, what you're seeing. And what we've begun to think is that then um, the director, after they did one trial, two trials, three trials, they get very comfortable in the position of being the director and see, see themselves as confident and leading and the other person as um, following and, and therefore in a weaker identity position. And that representation of the other was broken down in the position exchange because they were both directors and they both felt ownership over directing. 
and didn't dominate each other in, in the same sense. Uh, Blackgar, who I spoke to about this, he told me about when he did the, the experiment, he, he did it once with um, families where there was the parent and the child, and the child had schizophrenia. He did 10 diets like this and had to stop it because it was so, so uh, difficult. If the parent was directing a child with schizophrenia, they just couldn't solve the task because the parent would always say, you're confused take some time to think, no, no matter what the child said. And this is what I'm interested in, these ways in which we construct the other so that regardless of what they say, you know, the, the child with schizophrenia is telling the truth. There, there, there was no road there, but the parents couldn't listen. And that's that preconceived, that, that is what I would call a semantic barrier to dialogue. And that's what I want to talk a bit about. So, um, I'm pointing there, but I should be pointing here. Yeah. Just, is transformation always good? We live in a very heterogeneous society. There's a lot of difference out there. And imagine we were always transformed by social interaction. Well, that wouldn't be tenable either. If everyone we interacted with, we took on their point of view. Uh, we couldn't put together a project. We couldn't do a plan of action. Things like commitment and loyalty would fall apart because commitment is precisely, you know, even though other people have good ideas, I'm going to be committed to this. And we're not influenced by that. So, because we live in such a plural, multi-perspective society, we actually have to, in a sense, stabilize ourselves. And that's what I see this as doing. So it's not just negative, I think it often is negative, but we also have to see there's a, a possible benefit to um, yeah, trying to stabilize ourselves. And perhaps, sometimes we shouldn't listen to dangerous ideas. Ideas which aren't so good. So, um, This a, a approach then to semantic barriers, I, I, I take from a number of different sources here. I think when we're looking at um, contact and a lot of the literature on contact, even child development or intergroup, it, it, people aren't actually focusing on the point of contact. And I mean when two people are actually interacting, the, the, the specific context of these two individuals, um, opening the black box of interaction. I mean, Annalie has done it and Karis has done it, but these are exceptions to my mind. A, a lot of the, the theories are quite decontextualized and we're looking for abstract variables which promote contact. But at the end of the day, it's individuals in a specific context. And, and process, I think we have to understand processes like turn by turn, what is actually happening. And when it's, it's when we do that, we see the ideas which each, each person has about the other. And my point about content, and this is a point made often by Jared Devine in the social representations approach, Contact, I think we often think of it as bodies coming into contact, but that's not what's interesting at all. What's interesting is that there are ideas coming into contact. It is a semantic contact. Uh, that's why it can be not even face to face. Well, what it is is one body of knowledge interacting with another body of knowledge. And so what is the point of contact? Isn't co-presence in a physical sense. It is the ideas intermingling. And you can ask, how much do these ideas interpenetrate the other ideas and potentially transform them? So that's my kind of background to this approach or how I see it. And the semantic barriers idea, uh, originally put forward by Serge Moscovici in his analysis of psychoanalysis, and I've developed it a little bit. And, and Serge Moscovici, he, his study was in Paris in the 1950s, and he looked at Catholics, communists, and psychoanalysts. And at the time, um, the psychoanalyst was a spreading in society. It was, it was a kind of intergroup situation. Yeah. And uh, he noted that he, each of these groups really polarized from the other. The Catholics didn't like the communists, and that neither of them liked the psychoanalysts, and so on. And he was asking, how do they maintain these boundaries? And this is where it gets interesting. So you have the rigid oppositions, which we know from social psychology. But he also pointed out some strategies. So you get this sort of associations, is what he called it. And this is where, to, for example, the communists, everything American is bad. So if they wanted to taint psychoanalysis, they would call it American psychoanalysis. And by virtue of calling it American psychoanalysis, given how bad American, everything American is, you couldn't say anything positive about psychoanalysis. So it becomes a block to even engaging with psychoanalysis. And there was also, among um, the Catholics, he gives some examples of prohibitions and taboos, where one Catholic person said, you know, psychoanalysis is the work of the devil. And 
a couple of people actually gave a very similar thing. It was just evil, because you shouldn't be exploring your psychology in this way. But my point is that if you really think that about psychoanalysis, you can't engage in it. You, you have stopped any dialogical engagement with psychoanalysis before you've even begun the interaction. So even if there is an interaction, it's going to be a non-transformative interaction. Uh, and very common, and this relates more to trust, is undermining the motive of the other. So when uh, Moscovitz would ask, um, I think this is a Catholic, you know, who, who are psychoanalysts? And the, the quote is, a psychoanalyst is a maniac who takes an interest in the sexuality of others because he's obsessed with his own. <laughs> you know, it, it's a way of constructing this. So, so to this person, you're not going to say, well, I, I'm interested in psychoanalysis or something like that. You, you construct the situations and you feel awkward uh, supporting that point of view. And what I'm trying to draw attention to are these strategies by which we're, we're presenting the other in a non, a, non -transform, a way in which you can't even engage with it. So what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk, about three, five minutes or so, yeah? More. More. Oh dear, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not going too fast. And six minutes. Uh, so a couple of examples, some from my work and some from other people's work, um, to just illustrate this concept and explore some of the different strategies a bit further. Oh. Here. Yeah, I think influenced a little bit here by um, Maguire came up with an in inoculation theory of attitudes, and this is, um, I'll, I'll read you this quote, because I think it captures something about what's happening at, at the level of meaning. Just as we develop the disease resistance of a person raised in a germ-free environment by exposing him to a weakened form of the virus so as to stimulate, without overcoming his defenses, so, you know, so that's inoculation, a medical inoculation. So, we would also develop the resistance to persuasion of a person raised in an ideologically aseptic environment by pre-exposing him to weakened forms of counter-argument or to some other belief-threatening material strong enough to stimulate but not strong enough to overcome his belief and defenses. And the reason I have that there is, do you have, are, you, are people familiar with the phrase a straw man? Straw man. So we have a lot of straw men constructions of others. We, we represent others in very shallow ways. And I would argue that these are often sort of inoculations. They, they allow us to um, talk about the other, but in a way which is non-transformative. Because we can't go through the modern world without engaging with the other. Those days are gone. We're, we're not in a homogenous society. So I think to some extent, prejudice and so on has moved to a new level which means it can, at a cocktail party, talk with the other, but in a non-transformative way, through straw men constructions of their beliefs, through representing, and they can even have a discussion about their beliefs, but they're deeply represented in a non-transformative way. So that's what we'll have some examples of. Now, my first example is from a, a new chapter by Rosa and Wagner, um, and they were studying uh, intergroup tensions in Estonia. Uh, there's a uh, uh, Estonia was part of Russia, a lot of Russians moved into Estonia, Estonia got independence, and they had various flashpoints. And they were studying um, discussions online. And uh, they, they weren't using the term semantic barriers, they were interested in essentialism, but I would interpret their work in this way. And I'll just present one quote, this is taken out of context a bit, but from an online discussion, that's what they found. And this is an Estonian talking about the Russians. And the Estonian says, the Mongol gene of robbing and killing and hating the work has been coded into the Russians. They do not go back to Russia because they do not have the sense of homeland. They only have the gene of expansion and empire. Um, and you see, so what they're saying, you know, I mean, this isn't the kind of person you're going to go in dialogue with. They're constructed again in, in a way that which it represents them as almost um, beyond reason and rationality. It reminded me a little bit, I did a study myself in Northern Ireland of the conflict there, and one phrase which has stuck in my mind for 10 years from an online discussion as well is, is just, um, they kill for no other reason than the joy of killing. You know? and, and that way it's just dismissing, so no matter what they say, it's a, that, that's just what they do. But no one kills for the joy of killing. Or I don't think we should believe that. I think that's a very dangerous belief, basically. People have rationality. And, but this one's also interesting because they use the word gene. I mean, there's, there's nothing in this which is genetic, but 
to construct something or the other, the difference of the other, especially the negative difference, as genetic, which modern discourses afford, makes it immutable. This, this can't change. Within the logic of its own argument, this is not open to change. And I think we have to represent the other as open to change, just as much as we have to represent ourselves as open to change. Otherwise, again, you're going to have non-transformative social interaction. Um, this example is from work done by Rio Sullivan Lago uh, in Ireland, looking at uh, immigrants. And um, here we see an example of distrust. I think this is a very good example here of how distrust can just block all dialogue. And uh, this person, I think we call him Aiden, uh, is talking about asylum seekers. And this is what he says. I just don't like to talk to most asylum seekers. Avoidance, of course, is the greatest strategy of non-transformative, but it's, it's not social interaction. But he says, I don't like to talk to most asylum seekers. Like, especially, you know, most of them are either on the run from the law in their own country, and if they go back to their own country, they'll get persecuted for this, that, or the other. So he's saying that they're actually fugitives. They've done something wrong in their own country. And that's why they've come to the Republic of Ireland. And, and our country doesn't wonder why they're so afraid to go back home to their own, their own country. And then he sort of quotes them and says, oh, they'll probably get killed or something like that. You know, they make up all these excuses. So here's the interesting thing. You have two parts. You have them. Um, this is, you know, they'll probably get killed. You know, we might say, well, maybe they will get killed. But how is that very powerful idea, sending these people home to get killed? How come that doesn't affect it? He goes, why? You know, he's still able to brush away these people who are going to get killed if they go home. He's able to brush it away because of his construction of them as fugitives on the run. So from Aiden's point of view, regardless of what the asylum seeker says, he goes, oh, well, they would say that. That's, I'm not surprised. They'll say anything to say. It's, it's a non-transformative construction of the other, um, which blocks dialogue. And uh, the last example is from Irene, and, uh, some very nice data, uh, from her study of uh, immigrants in Greece. And, and there's examples of different ones, but here I want to just complicate things a bit by showing how people are using sort of semantic barriers, blockers to dialogue, to stop themselves engaging with stigmatizing ideas, because it's not that the other always has a, something we should take on board. Sometimes the other is trying to stigmatize us. And this is very clear in the discussion from Irene's data of three uh, African women, or African Seychelles, two African and one from the Seychelles, and they're talking about the Greek people uh, being racist against them. Okay? And uh, Bicet says, you know, sometimes, let me tell you another story. Because of the work that I'm doing, they used to invite me, like a white man, a Greek man, to go to a restaurant and eat, or go somewhere. When you go there, ah, and they would look at the Greek man, like, what is this? So this is kind of, in the context, it's very clear, like, well, what are you doing with a black woman and, and a sort of racist attitude? Um, yes, yes, they look surprised, I don't know why. And then Asha says, yes, crazy people, crazy people. And again, crazy is a classic way of, if someone's crazy, you don't have to listen to what they're saying. So it's a, but in this case, a very good protection. They are crazy. Um, and he said, one funny thing I have to tell you laughingly, those Greek people, they believe that we are possessed by the devil. Many of them ask me, read their hands, read coffee cups and so on, and they think we're possessed by the devil. And here what I just point to is the language of belief and think. Uh, whenever we use to talk about ourselves, we, we say, the, the case is X. And if someone else says that, we say, they believe X. Yeah. Yeah? And by doing that, this sort of bracketing of the ideas of the other into beliefs and attitudes and, and so on, we are actually separating from reality and, and, and again, sort of protecting ourselves from it because it's just a belief. Whereas, of course, we don't have beliefs, we, we know the truth. <laughs> and, and that's another way in, in which we block things. So, in conclusion, and um, what I've tried to say is that social interaction, transformative social interaction, isn't just a physical kind of co-presence of bodies. It is a semantic interaction of two knowledge systems of representations coming together. And we need to look at the content of those representations. And particularly that um, we can construct the other in, in ways which just mean that whatever they say, we're not really going to listen. And I would like to see, and this is my happy ending, um, I would like to see us be more aware of constructing the other 
in non-transformative ways, so that when people are doing it, we can say, well, you know, this really isn't going to lead to any change if we all think of each other like this. Uh, and we need to represent the other as rational, as um, trustworthy, and, and um, then we have to listen, because if you do that, you can't dismiss what they say very easily. So, thank you.
it's more you know, about ideas coming into contact rather than you know, physical bodies coming into contact, which would matter more. Um, the former would matter more. So, what do you think about the role of physical contact? I mean, you know, would it have, would it have an additive effect, a facilitating effect, or would it have an harmful effect? Because uh, there are also you know, the representations of the other typically has a physical element attached to it as well. So in Northern Ireland, you know, the Catholics might think, oh, everybody was a tattoo, you know, is, is a Protestant perhaps. You know, if you ask people, they're very um, comfortable coming up with a physical image of the other. So would this have to kind of go hand in hand when, you know, we're, we're working for change, or is it just the ideas? Um, and this is a very good, good point. Uh, my, my answer to that begins with something I haven't talked about, but I, I, I really like Levinas and his ethics. And, and the ethics is grounded in the face of the other. This is the point of truth, which is when you look in the other, uh, the eyes of the other, basically. And I don't think you could um, say some of these things looking into the eyes of the other. And it would become very difficult. And it's no coincidence that some of the examples I gave are from online discussions uh, within the group. So it's easy to say to your own in group, oh, those other people are crazy, you know, they killed for the content. It's very difficult to look in the eyes of that other person and say, I think you killed for no reason. <laughs> um, and so the, the, the face of the others actually has a central point, I would say. If, if we did it all mediated and distant, even ideas can get distorted. There is some, the, the face of the other demands respect and recognition in a way which ideas and online discussions don't, don't have. So I think that is very important. The roots of evil. The roots of evil. There's a book called yeah. The Roots of Evil. I have I forget the, the authors at the moment, but there are very, very salient and poignant uh, sequences about uh, how people do evil to each other using physical clothes. Okay. I mean, staring at the other, uh, invalidating its his existence, so to say, by one's own. But it, this is the rare exception. Yeah. But it does exist. It did, yes, you're right. Of course, in torture and so on. In torture, I don't know how torture, they, very, very systematically. Yeah. And uh, I mean, in the past war, they used this uh, CIA and the Gestapo, used of uh, the alien. He is fixated physically. I think it's a really good question. How do you find it? Um, so, thank you, and perhaps also a comment if I also may use my <laughs> role here. Um, but this also resonates from my perspective as a, a teacher educator, um, the way in which um, the teachers and the student teachers become increasingly aware of the kind of complexities of um, teaching diverse groups where um, it is not just semantics, I mean, they are there, and this sort of changes the discourses, oftentimes just towards political correctness, but oftentimes also towards more um, um, discourses sustaining um, cooperation and deconstructing these sort of uh, barriers. So thank you very much. And for the question. similar concerns to those presented uh, in these papers. Uh, very limited knowledge of the literature that is actually being used. Uh, so I'm being asked to lead the discussion on transformative and non-transformative interaction in human and social development. I try to put this in the context of what I know, and let's see whether this might, might be that. And in political science, a related term to what is being used to discuss these kind of issues uh, is uh, the term uh, conflict transformation, which means specifically how to transform violent conflicts into nonviolent ones or no conflict, how to bring actor 
and issue transformation, how to engender peaceful and cooperative relationships in uh, regions with a history of protracted ethnic or other problems, and doing so uh, through a wide-ranging approach that looks beyond elite political negotiation. It is very important to remember the relation to ethnic transformation, right? uh, to relation to conflict transformation. Uh, Broadly speaking, this term conflict transformation has for me certain advantages over other terms that we commonly use in, in political science, like conflict management or even conflict resolution. Uh, 